Hello, everyone. My name is Debbie Fox, and I'm the Housing Specialist at the National Network in Domestic Violence. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar on how domestic violence programs can develop well-designed housing projects. Today, you'll be hearing from three speakers, so I'll turn it over to them in a moment. Um, we'll get started with Mary O'Dockerty from the Kentucky Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for um, attending our webinar. Today, we want um, to tell you all how domestic violence programs can develop well-designed housing projects. And um, you can't do that if you don't understand the continuum of care process and you don't know about the NOFA, which is the HUD's Notice of Funding Availability. Okay, I have some help today on our webinar. Um, I am the, the Deputy Director of the Kentucky Coalition Against Domestic Violence, um, and with me um, is Rosemary Luckett, uh, Manager of Program Quality for the Housing Contract Administration at Kentucky Housing Corporation. In, um, Kentucky Housing Corporation is the, uh, the agency that administers most of the funding HUD sends to Kentucky. And last, we have Michelle Yodstol. Michelle is Economic Justice Program Director at BRASS in Bowling Green, Kentucky. BRASS is one of KCADV's 15-member programs, and BRASS has, for many, many years, run an excellent housing program, and I'm really thrilled that we get a chance today to shine a national spotlight on their great advocacy and housing work. Okay, this work is part of a brand new consortium, well, it's a, a, a year or so old, the Domestic Violence and Housing Technical Assistance Consortium. This is a consortium that um, provides training and technical assistance and resource development at the critical intersection of domestic violence and sexual assault services and homeless and housing services. Um, this consortium is all about helping domestic violence programs work more effectively with HUD and HUD-funded agencies. Later in this webinar, you'll hear about some trainings and resources the coalition, the consortium rather, is providing to the field. I hope you'll be as pleased as I am about the topics the consortium has decided to focus on. Also, a quick shout out um, to the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Um, NNEDV um, is the host, the convener of this webinar, um, and is a key player in the consortium uh, that we just talked about. Um, NNEDV is also um, leads us fearlessly, I might add, um, in the DV housing policy world. Um, NNEDV has done a great job advocating for domestic violence programs um, and has done a lot of work directly with HUD on our behalf. Okay. We know, um, we all know that we've had challenges. Um, the domestic violence world has had challenges um, working with HUD and, and, and HUD agencies. Um, and I, that's, I think, a key reason why the consortium uh, was created. Um, and I think it's important to note that, that domestic violence programs, first of all and foremost, are dedicated to ensuring the safety and stability of survivors. Uh, that's our number one um, charge, our number one priority. However, pretty quickly after that, I'd argue that housing is the number one need voiced by most, of, most survivors who show up at our programs. Um, our focus on confidentiality and safety sometimes presents challenges for our funders, and, and HUD is no different. Um, I'd argue that, that HUD's focus on faster exits from shelter into housing has become the most difficult issue we're dealing with today. Um, HUD's target um, that housing families move into housing 30 days after entering shelter presents challenges, um, especially if a survivor's safety is still in jeopardy 30 days after she's moved into to shelter. Um, in a few minutes, you'll hear from Rosemary Luckett, um, who provides HUD grantees in Kentucky with a lot of sage advice and guidance in her role at our State Housing Finance Agency. 
Rosemary tells us that it's important to remember that the 30-day target, HUD's 30 days, uh, HUD's goal that folks leave shelter 30 days after they get there and get into housing 30 days later um, is a goal set by HUD, but it's not a hard and fast goal. It's rather something that we need to be moving toward. So, so perhaps um, a better way to think about the 30-day goal is that it's, a, it's HUD's way of saying it wants us to be focused on reducing the time families stay in shelter. I think part of the reason why Kentucky is, is uh, the Kentucky Coalition is doing this webinar today is that in Kentucky, um, we've had um, DV programs and homeless service providers have, have had a really good track record of working together. Um, and, and the reason is pretty simple. Um, domestic violence programs um, have been participating in an engaged way in our state's continuum of care process since it was established in the mid-1990s. Um, many of the executive directors of our programs were sitting around the table the first time HUD said, we're going to do this through a continuum of care process. So consequently, all but one of Kentucky's 15 domestic violence programs receives HUD funding. Um, almost all of our programs have ESG grants, and about half have funding through the continuum of care. Um, and the coalition, KCADV, we also have a, have a HUD grant. We have a rapid rehousing grant um, that we just launched in December. We're going to be providing housing services to about 40 families this year. I wanted to underscore that most of the housing advocacy work that KCADV does is with the balance of state continuum. Um, which serves all but two counties in Kentucky. Um, in other words, every part of Kentucky except Louisville and Lexington are two largest urban areas. It's really important to remember that HUD gives Continuum of Care's flexibility when it comes to setting up their, hunt, their funding processes. So, so consequently, every Continuum of Care has its own grant scoring system, and we're going to be talking more about that as we move on. Um, so um, I thought it would be good to, to review some project types and some HUD priorities and some important terms that you're going to be hearing a lot today and that you're going to hear um, other times. Um, permanent housing, that's HUD's top priority, moving families into permanent housing. You'll also hear us talk about permanent supportive housing. Permanent supportive, with permanent supportive housing programs, HUD um, places no limit on the assistance for clients, but all the clients who are served through permanent supportive housing programs have disabilities. Rapid rehousing. Rapid rehousing programs provide rental assistance for up to 24 months. Um, however, I think it's important to note that most rapid rehousing programs provide housing assistance for less than 24 months, some for only three months. Um, KCADV's rapid rehousing program limits assistance to 12 months. Transitional housing, that is um, a program that, uh, a HUD program that domestic violence programs have been, um, have been pretty involved with. Uh, under transitional housing programs, assistance can be provided for up to 24 months. And then um, you've heard me already use the, the acronym ESG. That's for emergency solutions grants. And um, emergency solution grants um, are really can be a terrific resource for domestic violence programs because ESG grants fund shelter operations and also rapid rehousing assistance. And, and finally, um, coordinated entry system. You're going to hear us talk a fair bit about coordinated entry systems today. Um, uh, a, coordinated, a coordinated entry system is a strategy, um, a HUD strategy to help homeless service providers ensure that people with the most acute needs are given priority. Um, and here's what you guys really need to know about the coordinated entry strategy. In January, HUD issued a notice that said continuums of care must have a written coordinated entry policy and procedure that addresses inter, uh, IPV. In other words, continuums of care must have a policy on how they will address domestic violence and sexual assault victims who seek services from non victim service providers. Okay, 
If you can remember only one thing from this webinar, I hope you'll remember that if you, your program um, participates in the continuum of care service, you will greatly benefit um, the survivors that you serve. Um, participating in the continuum of care process um, gives your program a chance to inform non-domestic violence providers about your services and other important ideas like trauma-informed care, uh, voluntary services, and screening people in instead of screening people out. Those are philosophies that the domestic, domestic violence world has, has, has long um, endorsed and embraced and preached about um, participating in your continuum of care as a way to help spread those, the word about those important strategies. Um, but, um, and the, most, the best continuum of care boards have multiple victim service providers on them and domestic violence coalition staff involved. I know that's the case here in Kentucky. Um, also, please know that HUD requires that victim service providers are represented on continuum of care boards. So I hear a lot from people uh, when I go to national conferences or go to trainings um, and we talk about housing. I hear a lot from, pe from people who work at domestic violence programs that they don't want to run a housing program. That, you know, they, they want to work with their partners and their communities, but they, they themselves don't want to run um, a housing program. And um, I guess I'm here today to say that you should participate in the continuum of care process even if you don't want to run a housing program. Um, participating expands housing options for your clients through partnerships and relationships that you build with housing, uh, other housing providers. And this is, um, this is amplified by the, the coordinated entry systems that, that are now being put into place across the country. Um, HUD is requiring coordinated entry systems to have a policy on how it will address the needs of DV survivors who are seeking services from, from non-DV survivors. Um, the way that the coordinated system, the coordinated entry system will work is um, these coordinated entries will create prior, prioritization lists that will determine who gets housing. And um, everybody will be required to use a screening tool to, de to determine the, the priority, the place on that priority list uh, that, that folks will have. In Kentucky, we use the VI SPDAT, which I think is pretty well known um, across the, the, the country. I think a lot of states um, are using the VI SPDAT. Um, after, once your coordinated entry system is up and running, picking up the phone and telling a housing provider you have a client who needs housing isn't going to work anymore. Your client's going to need to be on that prioritization list in order to get a housing referral. So not participating in the continuum of care is really going to limit the option, options for the survivors that you serve. Um, I talked earlier about how HUD allows the continuum of care um, flexibility when they set up their their policies and especially with regards to their um, their grant scoring tool um, one of the reasons I think one of the biggest reasons um, that um, you should participate in your continuum of care is that you can help shape the continuum of care's policies on coordinated entry um, also um, Many domestic violence programs that don't have housing programs do receive and rely on ESG grants. So it's important to know that, that the HUD-funded agencies that make up, that, that make your ES, ESG grants are accountable to the continuum of cares. So participating in the continuum of care is a way to have input into the policy-making part and evaluation of your ESG program. So now I'm going to pass the microphone over to Rosemary Luckett, who works uh, very closely with KCADV member programs here in Kentucky. Um, take it away. Okay, thanks, Mary. Thanks, everybody, for participating until there's a very large list of people signed on. And I think it's great that you are doing this type of a webinar. Um, I mean, this is something that you know non-DV groups and everybody could benefit from, so I think it's a, it's a good opportunity. Um, 
As Mary said, I work with the uh, Housing Finance Agency, and we act as the collaborative applicant for the COC program, which means that we're, we do all the coordination and planning and deal with the board and things like that. But we also uh, serve as the ESG grantee for the entire state. So um, we're affected in a lot of ways by the COC process one way or the other, and as Mary said, some agencies get both types of funding and some only get emergency solutions grant, uh, but still need to be mindful of, you know, the whole piece of the um, what goes together to get there. Um, I wanted to kind of speak specifically to projects that are interested in pursuing or may already have a COC project uh, because, you know, how to design a high scoring housing program really would apply to renewals or agencies that are interested in new funding because um, the way HUD designs their program, the COCs, like Mary said, have to design a rating and ranking tool that determines who, you know, the priority that HUD's going to fund uh, for that COC. Um, so HUD has not said, and they won't likely ever say, that they won't uh, fund a particular type of project. Uh, they definitely leave the final decisions about who gets funded to the local continuums of care so that they can tell which um, projects they value and that are high performing uh, based on their criteria. Uh, now, they do put limits on new projects, but still allow for some flexibility driven by local need, meaning uh, that they may say, well, we're only going to fund permanent housing projects, but then they leave it wide open as far as, you know, whether they're going to be PSH or rapid rehousing and which uh, populations they're going to target and, you know, how they design their programs really at that level. So it, while it's restrictive in some ways, it can be very flexible. Uh, Mary already mentioned, and we'll use the term like uh, several more times throughout this uh, discussion about the HUD priorities. You know, what we've seen in our continuum is that um, understanding and adopting or following HUD priorities when it works for your project are key to being able to get successfully ranked locally and to compete nationally, even if you're in a lower ranking position at the national level and you're competing, you're still going to have a much more likely chance to get funded if you're following the HUD priorities. And, and clearly, you know, Housing First and Serving Chronically Homeless have always, I mean, for many years, HUD's been talking about that and as well as participating in the coordinated entry system. Um, you know, following those two priorities of following a Housing First model and prioritizing those with the highest need um, are both going to be in place at HUD for quite some time. So uh, for projects that haven't looked at that or made adjustments to their program to allow for it, they, you know, it's not too late. You can still do that. In uh, our Kentucky Balance of State COC in the 2015 application, we had um, many projects that were in Tier 2 that were either unable to adjust their programs to fit that, uh, the HUD priorities, or um, just not interested in it. And um, we had a total of five transitional housing projects and one permanent housing project that did not get funded. And I think if we feel that if they had adjusted their programs or um, been able to make changes to align with the HUD priorities that they would have, uh, several of those could have gotten funded. You know, the funding is limited, period, but there's always um, better chances there. We've mentioned uh, the rating and ranking tool. Um, under the HUD NOFA, and I think it will probably continue for a few more years, uh, for the last several years they have established a tiering system which uh, basically based on a local COC's prior ranking um, and rating process, um, depending on how the projects score in that list 
will determine whether they're ranked in Tier 1 or Tier 2. Uh, it's really just a funding line. HUD says, you know, 85% or in 2015 they said 85% of your funding was going to fall into Tier 1. You know, the first um, projects going down the list until you hit 85% of your funding and then the remainder were in Tier 2. Um, it doesn't necessarily say that the COC has established the good and bad um, categories. It's just saying that where the funding runs out or hits that certain level, then projects fall into Tier 2. Um, those rating and ranking criteria are determined locally, but they are usually heavily weighted towards HUD priorities or their intended outcomes. So that means that you, it's very important that an agency interested in funding pays attention to both what is going on locally and what the priorities are there, but also to the national priorities so that um, they can ma kind of maximize their um, rating and ranking and where they're going to fall. Uh, if your project ranks high enough that it falls into Tier 1, um, which I said was really just a funding line, then you're considered to be what I always refer to is in the safe zone, meaning that there's very little risk that HUD would not fund your project uh, unless it's just totally out of compliance or something like that. Uh, and so, you know, once you're in Tier 1 and you go to HUD, they don't do very um, in-depth look at what your uh, project looks like, you know, other than making sure it meets some minimum criteria. If your project ranks lower and falls into Tier 2, uh, then it's in the iffy zone, it's in the not so safe zone. Um, to be included in Tier 2 kind of opens up a lot of other variables. Um, tier 2 projects, um, likelihood of getting funded is based on how well the COC performs, meaning all of the pieces, you know, related to coordinated entry and data and everything, as well as how well the project itself meets the local and the national priorities, like housing first serving those highest need and things like that. So um, again, participating in the COC is definitely going to give you a better idea of what um, outcomes and designs are going to be most likely to perform well in those ratings. Let's talk a little bit about the, some of the bigger priorities that HUD's got their focus on. Uh, housing first definitely is not a new term because has been referring to that and encouraging uh, projects to follow that model for quite some time. Adopting the Housing First model I think has been very intimidating for projects over the past several years, but I can see from our local area that once an agency looks closely at what it takes to follow the principles, it isn't always as big of a challenge as they expect it to be. Um, I think we had a lot of agencies who thought that Housing First really meant a totally hands-off approach to clients, when really um, what it means is that there's low barrier to entry, definitely a high tolerance for relapses and mistakes along the way for the clients, uh, but certainly targeting um, the clients that have high needs like substance use disorder or criminal records or, or DV or any of those vulnerable populations. It needs to ensure that agencies uh, need to have services available based on the individual client needs, not so much a one-size-fits-all approach, which allows the clients to choose services they want, not so much uh, services that we as the providers may think they need. I know that this fits well with the voluntary service philosophy required by the DV funders, so uh, it in some ways can be a really easy fit for DV agencies as long as they're, you know, kind of adopting a whole a holistic approach to that. Um, it is important to note for those with reservations about going down the housing first path that HUD allows for some minimal case management requirements. Uh, basically so that agencies can stay in touch with the clients to ensure that their client's service needs are being met. They just don't want to see a whole bunch of mandatory services related to lifestyle or um, behavior and things like that that would not otherwise ensure their housing stability. Uh, those projects that I mentioned earlier 
that uh, did not that failed to get funded in the 2015 competition. Um, none of them had um, selected a housing first model. Definitely, of the five transitional housing projects that lost their funding that year, three of those were DV providers. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues that may or may not have led to them being able to make a shift, but certainly the conversation needs to be prioritized. Uh, a second major priority for HUD is definitely uh, that PSH permanent support housing programs should serve chronically homeless. Um, you know, this has been a big challenge for all agency types, whether they're DV or not, in the fact that there was a lot of concern about, well, we don't have enough chronically homeless clients in our area, or what if I uh, have a vacant bed, do I hold it open, and things like that. HUD has been really good at clarifying a lot of that for us. And um, they've put out some notices that were, uh, kind of gave agencies the right path on, on how to deal with that. Most COCs across the nation have adopted HUD's prior prioritization model of serving the highest need clients first. So even if your project beds are not required under your grant rules to target chronically homeless, if you're serving the highest need person in your uh, community or your area anyway, you're likely to be serving any chronically homeless clients that are presenting. Uh, under HUD guidance, though, if no chronically homeless clients are presenting for service and you can document due diligence in seeking them out, you can then just move to the next highest need person on the list. So there's not this, you know, the fear of what if I've got these vacant beds or units and how do I deal with that it can be mitigated by the fact that um, you've done sufficient outreach and documented all of the um, right avenues to have done outreach to them and there just wasn't anybody presenting. One good thing, Mary definitely mentioned this uh, coordinated entry process is that in most communities, the coordinated entry process will both help you identify and help do that outreach that might be challenging to some smaller agencies, but it also will basically provide the documentation of the due diligence that um, is necessary to say we don't have any, you know, we've done all this work in our community and there's no one presenting. So that's a place that the tool can really be helpful. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about outcomes. Um, the, the outcomes listed here as far as exiting to permanent housing, gaining or increasing income. Any agency that has worked with their continuum of care or even with their ESG uh, grantor will recognize that all of these listed here are elements to HUD system performance measures. Um, while system performance measures uh, under HUD are measuring the COC area as a whole and not a project by project um, activity, each project within the system will still impact the COC's competitiveness nationally uh, under system performance measures. And I know when I mentioned uh, Tier 2 earlier, I talked about how part of the way you get funded in Tier 2 is based on how your COC competes nationally. Uh, that's a place that, while it might not seem important on a project-specific basis, it could have a great impact on um, how your project competes should you end up in a Tier 2 area. Um, so, you know, each project can do their part, to, as Mary mentioned earlier, about moving towards, even if they can't hit the HUD targets, the, the more they can move towards some of HUD targets, on getting people housed quickly and getting them stable in housing will have an impact on the overall system performance measures. Okay, okay. so um, related to system performance measures and the HUD priorities, definitely uh, if any place that a project might be weak in one place, they can kind of make up some ground by doing better in other areas either at the local level or uh, at the national level. Um, so you want to make sure that where you're suffering or, or struggling with certain outcomes, the more you can focus on HUD priorities will make a, a big difference for your um, area. 
most COCs are going to be evaluating their rating and ranking process every year. So each year that they implement a rating and ranking process, at the end of that process, they're going to look back and say what, what did well, what did not work well, and how do we make adjustments. Uh, this is when being at the table for the discussions can be extremely important. DV agencies won't be able to establish policy, but being present to bring up the topics important to DVs and have a significant impact, um, especially if prior rating tools tilted the table in a negative direction for DV agencies because, you know, the collaborative applicant, no matter what, they're looking at something across a broad spectrum and may not be uh, tuned into some of the nuances that have a you know disparate impact on particular projects or populations or things like that. Uh, we do that every year at the Kentucky Balance of State. We've you know made some adjustments in recent years to add uh, kind of a buffer for transitional housing projects that were either serving substance use disorders or uh, um, DV clients, so that we could kind of level the playing field on that. Uh, we do still have a few transitional housing projects that are funded out of our continuum of care. Safe Harbor in Ashland, which is in northeast Kentucky, uh, has still is a DV provider that is still receiving transitional housing funds from the COC program. Uh, the project has been producing outcomes that line up with HUD priorities well enough to score well at the COC uh, level through our rating and ranking process. And in most recent rounds, their score has given them a, a fairly secure spot in the Tier 1 zone. Now, with changes from year to year in local priorities and HUD priorities changing, as well as the fact that other agencies are continuing to improve theirs, no project really can be comfortable or safe with exactly where they scored last year. So everyone needs to just always look at their project, see if they need to adjust every year and improve in any areas to make them more competitive. Um, in the coming year, although we know practically nothing about it because we've only gotten a hint of it in the registration notice, there's going to be a new project type for transitional housing pro or a new project type called um, transitional housing and rapid rehousing. It's a joint component. Uh, it definitely allows uh, for the communities take advantage of the uh, good things about transitional housing, but still have the permanent housing component of rapid rehousing in there to get the clients moved on and, and kind of in a, in a more stable uh, place. We hope uh, that it's HUD's way of saying that they recognize that you know some transitional housing programs for particular projects are very effective and you know can have uh, some good outcomes. Uh, maybe also a new, an opportunity to allow for new uh, funding for agencies that have uh, populations that definitely do better with transitional housing or the temporary assistance under rapid rehousing and that they would be able to pursue that in lieu of just having the option of like permanent supportive housing. Uh, we don't know yet until we get all the details whether it's going to be a good fit for our remaining transitional housing projects, but we will be looking closely at it with them to see what opportunities are available. Every transitional housing project in the nation is, should be doing that. I encourage anybody, whether your COC initiates the discussion or not, uh, that you take a really close look at the NOFA if you're interested in it when it comes out and make contact with your COC if you're interested in it. because um, it. it It'll move fast, and you need to be kind of be prepared for what you might find. Uh, lastly, I wanted to point out that there is going to be some additional information. Uh, there's an opportunity for a webinar put on by the National Alliance in Homelessness called What is the Transitional Housing Rapid Rehousing Joint Component? Uh, it's definitely um, going to be more information than we've got at this point, but hopefully by June 15th we'll have a lot more. Um, but it's you know June 15th from 2 to 3, and uh, usually they allow for a lot of registrants on that, so uh, I encourage everybody to look into that. Now, I'm going to pass it on to Michelle Yolstel from uh, Bear River Area Safe Space and let her talk a little bit about her um, permanent housing project that they run out of their shop there. Hello, everybody. Um, just real quick first. Um, 
all of my webinar has timed out. And so I don't even know if anybody is still out there or not. Um, just putting that out there. Um, so I don't know what's going on with the connection. Um, but I will go ahead with my part. Um, I'm the Economic Justice Program Director at Barron River Area Safe Space. We're in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, I've been with the shelter since 2002. Um, I'm also a certified alcohol and drug counselor, and that kind of helps play into the housing part. Um, we annually serve about 120 clients through permanent supportive housing and rapid, rehouse, rapid rehousing. Um, we had uh, 70 clients that were in our permanent supportive, and we've helped 50 families or single women with rapid rehousing. We strictly go by the VI SPDAT score now to determine who is eligible for housing. I think that the coordinated entry assessment is fabulous because it takes out any kind of bias or any kind of um, other determination from anyone else. Um, the score is strictly what we go by now. Um, so we know immediately who we have to house. We, it, when people, when victims of domestic violence come into the shelter, we assist with everything. Um, the very first thing we do is a housing assessment, and that's to identify barriers. We like to identify whether they have old bills, whether they owe past due rent, or if they've been evicted. And we also need to know if they have owed outstanding utility bills. We also like to help people fill out housing applications. When they come into the shelter, we determine which housing they qualify for. Unfortunately, a lot of our women have either drug charges or they have evictions. Um, sometimes they have assault four charges, which eliminates them from public housing. And so we like to find out where they're at before we even get started. We also help them with budget and we pull their credit report um, to see if there's any kind of evictions or anything on their credit report. The funding through HUD funds one full-time employee and six partial employees some, at some stages through the housing process. Um, one of our advocates, actually her only job in this process is to build relationships with landlords she helps find housings, she does the inspections, and helps them get the utilities inspected, or connected, sorry. Um, and this helps a lot because we really need, you really need a network of landlords. I know there was a question earlier about the FMR and um, through HUD, and that is a huge problem because housing here in Bowling Green is a lot more expensive than what HUD allows. But we have actually been able to work with several landlords um, they even call us now if they anticipate openings because they know that if they're working with us, then there's more to it than just renting an apartment. We also help with the case management and help them stay in their apartment if they're having problems. We also help people sign up for Section 8. Bowling Green is a little different than a lot of other the places in the state. We actually have a city Section 8, a county Section 8, a public housing authority, and then we have six project-based housing places. Um, the waiting lists are always full, um, and so we determine if the ladies don't, or the clients, not ladies, um, if the clients have any issues, then we figure out what housing they can have. If they don't, then we actually help them gather all their documents to apply for some sort of public housing as well. Um, the entire time that they're in the shelter, we do case management with them to kind of guide them toward housing. Um, the next slide says, it talks about our piece, our permanent supportive housing. We started our permanent housing in the fall of 2006. Actually, that's when our first families were put on. We have 27 slots. We have um, 12 for single women, 15 for families. And again, their VI SPDAT score, their coordinated entry ranking, determines who we put into available slots. Um, 
for permanent supportive housing, the women have to have disabilities, and those are verifi verifiable disabilities, whether it's mental health, whether it's substance abuse, or both. Um, our housing clients actually are referred by the shelter, and our permanent supportive housing pays 100% of their rent for indefinitely. We also pay the security deposit and we pay the utility deposit. Um, a lot of times here, it's a lot easier to find apartments that have utilities included, especially for single women, and so we help them with that too, so they don't have any bills. But during that time, while they're in our permanent supportive housing, they have they are required to do case management with us. Um, we discuss budgets, we discuss goals, we discuss issues that they're housing that they're having. We can pull their credit report um, and work on them paying old bills. Um, it's just really client based and what they need. Um, we have to meet them where they're at, not where we want them to be. And so we just start from the beginning. What is it you want to accomplish while you're in the housing program? Um, and so our peace program is leasing, so we have to go 100% by the FMR. And so there's no, we still have to do rent reasonableness, but we still have to go under the FMR guideline. And so that's why it's very important to build relationships with landlords. With our rapid rehousing, when the Hearth Act came out in 2010, um, a lot of people didn't want to do rapid rehousing because they thought, I don't know, maybe that it was going to be too hard, but we jumped on it because a lot of times the women here in the shelter just need assistance, just getting started. It's very difficult to get into a place with deposits, utility deposits, and first month's rent. And so we jumped on the bandwagon with KHC and decided we were going to try it, and it has been very successful. We have been able to help several women, um, and it's kind of ironic. We, our numbers on our peace housing have shifted because we have been able to help so many single women with rapid rehousing. Um, most of the single women come in, they have a job already, they're ready to just get on with their lives. Although income isn't a requirement, it always helps. And so um, we help with our rapid rehousing. We can help up to 12 months, but we kind of set the limit at three because that um, gets them in, gets them able to save some money, and get going with their new life. Now, if they need further assistance, we can do a reset and actually help them with at least three months more. And so um, I think that the rapid rehousing is very successful um, and it's very good for certain clients. Um, one of the things, again, that we face is the low FMR. And so we've been able to work with landlords and do a two-month rent as the deposit because HUD says that you can use two months rent as the maximum deposit. And so that kind of helps the landlord say, hey, these people are committed to stay here, and it helps them, and sometimes they'll lower the FMR. Um, I actually serve on the, the COC board, and so I've been able to learn a lot about the coordinated entry and how it works and how to put that into place. I've also, the, the idea of using the two months rent as the deposit actually came from someone that I was talking with on the board. And so I just encourage everybody to get involved. Um, help make the policies for domestic violence victims. The housing works. It can be time consuming, but it is a very successful program. And the money is out there for everyone. Um, you just have to work with it. And so I'm now gonna turn it back over to Mary. Thank you, Ms. thank you, Michelle. Um, um, thanks. That was that was really good. Um, I'm going to very quickly um, talk about how coalitions, DV coalitions, 
can have a role have a role to play on COC boards. Um, in Kentucky, um, we have a staff member who goes to our um, our COC advisory board meeting. We have uh, staff who participate in regional meetings, um, and KCADV staff deal pretty regularly um, with the staff at Kentucky Housing Corporation when issues come up. Um, one of the things that, that I think has benefited our programs as a result of, of the coalition's participation is that we help devise a coordinated entry policy for uh, DV and non-DV shelters. Um, we also, um, KCADV manages data collection for our programs. Uh, we even got some financial support from our state housing finance agency to set up a separate non-HMIS data collection report for VSPs in the balance of state. And the report meets HUD's requirements, but it does not include any identifying information about survivors. Before we say goodbye, I want to draw your attention to um, a newly launched um, a newly um, a newly launched um, website website sorry a newly launched website um, that is available for everyone on this call um, and and many others who need information about the intersection of domestic violence and housing. This is um, the the website just went up I think today, and you'll see the link here on this slide. Um, this is uh, the first product of uh, the consortium that we, we started talking about at the beginning um, of this webinar. I think you're going to hear a lot about this consortium um, um, in the next few months. Um, I also want to give a mention, a shout out to a webinar that the consortium is, is doing. We don't have a date for it yet because it is um, about it's a primer on the NOFA application. Um, it's going to be a review of the, the FY17 application. It's going to review those HUD priorities that, we, that Rosemary talked about. Um, and it's going to talk about, I'm sure there's going to be some information about um, any kind of funding opportunities for domestic violence and sexual assault projects. So look for that, um, the date and the information about that that webinar. It'll probably be around a week after the NOFA is released. Um, you'll see on this slide uh, that there are some other other webinars that are that are coming up that do have dates. Um, uh, one about the rapid rehousing housing first project type, um, and more more information about coordinated entry systems and survivor safety for coordinated entry systems. Um, I think if you plug into this um, this webinar series you'll be well prepared um, for um, helping domestic violence survivors um, get housing through working with HUD and the continuous care process. So thanks for your attention. Um, we, we appreciate it. We have a little time for, for some questions. Um, I think the lines are going to be unmuted so that you all can, can just speak up and ask any questions that you have. Anybody have any questions? Okay. So I see um, Amy has raised a hand. What? What? Okay. Well. Um, okay. I'll. Um, um, here's a question, a really important question from Darlene um, Santana. She asks, "When is the NOFA coming out?" <laughs> And we're giggling here because um, the answer is any day now, right, Rosemary? <laughs> At any point, could be tomorrow, could be three weeks from now. <laughs> I think we. Um, I've also noticed a few questions about planning grants. Um, is um, Rosemary? How do you get a planning grant? Uh, under the COC NOFA, the planning grants are only uh, able to go to a coordinated or uh, the collaborative applicant. Uh, so it's whichever agency is coordinating the COC process for your continuum of care agency. Um, they have quite a bit of options about how they can use their planning grants. Some of them 
might, um, you know, put a lot of funds out locally to do some local initiatives and planning. Uh, a lot of times it is used to cover costs that um, really the collaborative applicant has probably been subsidizing for the past 15 or 20 years, but uh, the funding levels have been such that it's allowing the collaborative applicants to do quite a bit more out in the local communities with the funding. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, I, I've seen a couple of questions I can address pretty easily. Um, uh, Barbara's asking, can they, can we get, that they get a copy of this, of this um, PowerPoint? I'm sure that'll be available through um, and in EDV, and I did note, I did see a note that this webinar has been recorded. Um, Carol is asking, are there any examples of adjusted family VI spadats that address safety concerns for DV victims? Rosemary, do you know? Um, I am, no, I'm not an expert enough to speak to that. So. Okay. Um, I think I saw a note um, from Marion um, on the chat that that suggested that there may that there may well be, and I'm I, I'm I'm guessing that that's a great um, issue for the consortium to take up. I'm, I bet the consortium will be a, a good resource for information about um, the ISPDATs that address safe, safety concerns. Yeah, Marion, this is Debbie. I just wanted to. This Go is ahead. Debbie at NADV. I just wanted to jump in. People can contact the consortium or contact me, and we can um, give examples for folks and, and show them different um, options for modified VI spadets. Great, great. Here, um, here in Kentucky, we're using the 211 is who does a lot of the VI spadets, and there's a specific script for victims of domestic violence and if they identify as a victim, then 211 actually has them call the local shelter. So when they call the local shelter, then the shelter can actually safety plan with them as well as do the VI spadat. And that's, that's an example that I, I referred kind of briefly to that, but that, that is an example of something that um, KCADV and its member programs were able to work out um, with um, Kentucky Housing Corporation uh, through the continuum of care process. I mean, we, um, I still remember the day that, that our staffer came back from the COC meeting and said, hey, guys, this is something I think we're going to need to help our programs with. And we uh, called, called Kentucky Housing, and they came over, and we spent about, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour kind of hashing out um, an idea, um, and now uh, that that idea and that policy and and the script for what uh, non BV service providers would say um, um, when they were when they were screening calls all got hashed out, and 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 now it's it's part of our our system. We are in Kentucky in the balance of state. We are um, setting up our coordinated entry systems now. And you know, we we got the DV part uh, figured out first, actually. I don't know if you all can hear me. Lexington and Louisville, our other two areas, already have this process in place again. And what our victim service providers, or what happens is when the when the victim service provider to whom that applicant has been referred, when they do the VI spadat, they put uh, the score and only the score um, on a sheet, and that goes to the prioritization. Um, the committee, I think there's a new name for it now, but the local prioritization community, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and then that community, the score goes up. When housing is available, then the community contacts the, the, per, the victim service provider to get the person's information so that they can be contacted about their housing opportunity so that that protects the victim until housing is actually available um, because it only gives them the score and gives them the priority that they need to be able to access housing. So you just heard from Andrea Miller, who um, is the Kentucky Coalition's director of our of economic justice programs, which includes, of course, housing. That's a really important part of our economic justice work. Well, are there any other questions, Debbie? What 
Um, do you have any other questions you'd like me to address? No, this has been wonderful. Thank you all in Kentucky for um, organizing the webinar and sharing such great resources and information with everyone. Thanks for letting us talk about the work we're doing in Kentucky. Really appreciated the opportunity. Bye. Thanks to everyone who joined us. We'll be sending out the webinar information uh, for the series, the slides, and the recording out to everyone who registered. So even if you had technical problems, uh, you'll be able to view and hear the entire webinar. Thank you so much for joining. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you so much. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes. The leader has turned lecture off and your lines have been unmuted.